What does Adam mean? The Bible says Adam was the first man. What does Adam mean? Interesting question. I get that once in a while. The names in the Bible have very important meanings. God gave him those names for a very specific reason. Uh, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan. Well, Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enos means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahaliel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means preaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means the despairing. And Noah means rest. So if you put it all together, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down preaching that his death shall bring their despairing rest. Even the names in the Bible are trying to get a message across. Pretty amazing. So, years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine in uh, Mobile, Alabama. We, he's, I spoke at a church over there, and I'd known him for 20 years. He said, Brother Hovind, let's go to McDonald's. I want to show you something. So we went to McDonald's, had lunch, and he tore two pieces of paper out, and he wrote on there, Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat. I said, okay. He laid them on the table. He said, now you taught geometry, right? I said, yeah. He said, I want you to imagine that you are Mr. Flat, and you live in Flatland. Two dimensions. There is no third dimension. You have length and width, no height. I said, okay. He said, suppose I, as a three-dimensional being, would like to reveal myself to you, but you live in Flatland. How can a three-dimensional person express himself to a two-dimensional person? Well, you're going to have a real problem here. He said, if we have Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat, they're flat. All Mr. Flat sees of Mrs. Flat is a straight line. Now, he can walk around and figure out she's actually a rectangle. He can perceive the depth, but he can only see the width. You and I can see width and height. You do not see depth. You perceive depth. They call it depth perception. You could take a picture of what you're looking at, and it would look exactly on flat paper the same as it does in real life. Okay? So he said, if I want to reveal myself to Mr. Flat or Mrs. Flat, I walk over and I stick my finger through the table. Mrs. Flat, or Mr. Flat comes over and says, Oh, I've seen Kent Hovind. He's a circle. All they see is a cross section of my finger. Now then I stick three fingers through the circle over here, and Mrs. Flat says, Oh, no, I've seen Kent Hovind. He's three circles. And they're going to split the church and start the church of the one circle and the church of the three circles, I'm sure. But neither one <laughs> understands me. They've each only seen just a little bitty slice of the real me. So when God wanted to reveal himself... In this little three-dimensional world, he came down in the form of a man, Jesus Christ. There's an interesting verse in Ephesians uh, chapter 3. It says, That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length and depth and breadth and height, and to understand the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Now, wait a minute. There are four dimensions given there. Length, depth, breadth, and height. Is there more to God than we understand? I would say probably so. <laughs> probably a lot more to God than we understand. And I doubt anybody can say, I understand everything about God. If the infinite God would fit in my little three-pound brain, he would not be worth worshiping, that's for sure. Right? What about the races? Where do they come from? Well, you don't have to look around the world very long before you realize there are different colored people out there. I remember as my first time I saw a real black person. I don't mean brown. I mean black. Came from Africa. Black as my coat. I was in Atlanta, Georgia. This guy was visiting from Ethiopia. And I was probably seven years old. And I couldn't believe it. Not only was he black, his wife was black, and they had a baby that was black. I mean, black, black. I'd seen lots of brown people. I'd never seen a black one. It was like, wow. Where did the races come from? Actually, I don't think we should use the word races. There aren't different races. There are simply different skin colors. For instance, would you call these different races of cows? No, okay. They all look the same in the meat locker and they all taste the same on the hamburger, okay? <laughs> They're just skin color, all right? But there are four different theories of where the different skin colors come from. And I'll probably use the word races by habit, but I don't mean skin colors, okay? The first theory is Adam and Eve were medium brown and produced all the varieties in their own children. It's simply a melanin, a melanin count in the skin. There's a black couple that had three albino children. They didn't have much melanin in their skin, okay? The second theory says, the Lord put a mark upon Cain. And there are those who argue that Cain became black because of killing Abel. I think that's a stupid theory, but it's amazing how many folks believe that. Uh, the Mormons, for instance, teach that Cain was black, and black skin is a curse, the curse of Cain. They said it's the Lord's doing. But the Mormons teach that up in heaven, God the Father has thousands of wives, and He has sex with all these wives, and they produce spirit babies. Those spirit babies, if they're valiant, they come down to earth and get a white-skinned body. If they're not valiant, they come down and get a black-skinned body. 
So they look at black people and think, well, you were just, you were just inferior in your first life. What a dumb way to live. But that's what the Mormons teach, okay? They said, Cain, Ham, the whole Negro race have been cursed with black skin, the mark of Cain. This guy said, if, I, if there's one drop of Negro blood in my children, as I read to you, they receive the curse. Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the chose, white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty is death on the spot. And the good book, Secret History of the Mormon Church, covers a lot of the people who've been killed in Mormonism, you know, for violating the Mormon laws. The third theory says God put a curse on Canaan. Don't confuse Canaan with Cain. Canaan was Noah's grandson. If you read Genesis chapter 9, it says, uh, Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant shall he be. Twice the Bible says Canaan shall be a servant. And there are those who argue black people are supposed to be servants because God put a curse on Canaan. Okay, now I agree with the God put a curse on Canaan, but where do you get black people are supposed to be servants out of that? Aren't you assuming that Canaan was black and this curse applies to him? I don't believe that one either. The fourth theory, and I think the only logical theory in all of this, is the Tower of Babel is what caused it. God told them, hey, spread out. They said, no, we're staying right here, and they built a big tower, and God got angry and confused their languages. But not only did he divide the languages, he divided their tongues, their families, and their nations, Genesis chapter 10. Shem is writing this. Shem's the guy who kept the records of all the family records, you know. Chapter 10 is interesting. Small inbreeding groups will cause unusual traits to become very pronounced. For instance, for years, the Habsburgs had to marry royalty. That's just the rule. Well, sometimes the only royalty available to marry was your niece or your aunt or your sister. So they would marry royalty, and pretty soon they started looking real strange. You could tell, although he's a Habsburg. Got real long nose, stupid looking chin, and you know, he's got to be a Habsburg, okay? They look dumb. This is a picture of the feet of a guy, they're called the ostrich people in Africa. There's a tribe of folks in Zimbabwe, they are required to marry within the tribe. But there's only like 200 of them. So they are always marrying sisters or nieces or cousins. Always. The ultimate redneck. They only got two toes. Their teeth fall out in the middle of the night while they're sleeping. That's a result of incredible inbreeding. Unusual traits can become permanent with inbreeding, and that might have happened with the Tower of Babel. Genesis 10 says, These were the nations were divided after the flood. Not only the languages, the nations were divided. There's a great book on this topic by Bill Cooper. Uh, i got one here. It's in the library. After the Flood. Bill Cooper. Incredible book if you want to read that about the dispersion of the sons of Noah. What happened? Well, Japheth, one of the three sons, had about 14 kids and grandkids. It's a little difficult to count, believe it or not. You read Genesis 10 and see if you can count it. Try to do better than that. Okay? It's hard to tell who goes with who. But by my count, 14 kids and grandkids for Japheth. Ham had 31 kids and grandkids. One of them was Canaan. Now, if the curse was on Canaan, we got a problem. Because the Bible tells us Egypt is the land of Ham. Psalm 105, Psalm 106, Egypt is the land of Ham. The children of Ham migrated to Egypt. Africa was actually settled by the descendants of Ham. Black people apparently came from Ham. Japheth is the father of the Europeans, and Shem is the father of the Orientals, which includes Jesus Christ. They're considered actually Oriental, the Middle East. Okay? Um, Shem had 29 kids and grandkids. So by my count and my count only, I would say there are about 75 original nations and languages at the Tower of Babel, just adding up those three sons and their descendants. So I suspect when God confused the languages, there were about 75 of them just purely based on this, this graph here, this chart here. Most folks who study English will tell you that English, German, and Danish have a common root language. There are hundreds and hundreds of words that are identical. Here's Beowulf poem in 518 AD. This is English, actually, from 1500 years ago. Today's English is nothing like ancient English, and ancient English was very Germanic. Okay? Spanish, Italian, French, and Latin had a common root language. You can compare the words. People that speak Spanish can go to Italy and get along pretty good. People that speak Ukrainian can listen to Russian and get along pretty good. A lot of languages have common roots. There's a good book about the Chinese language, The Discovery of Genesis, it's called. If you want to get one of these, it's, uh, I forget, ten bucks, nine bucks. Uh, showing how the Chinese, original Chinese characters, not the ones they use today, but the original ancient Chinese pictograms were actually telling the creation story. For instance, the symbol for boat is eight 
mouths in a vessel. Noah's Ark had eight people on it. The Chinese symbol for garden is dust plus breath plus two people in an enclosure. There's also more in this book, uh, Search for the Truth, uh, by Bruce Malone. A lot of his articles in here are really good and are on our website. You can read some of Bruce's articles, but this is also a good book you'd want to get on the topic. There's been a sequel, God's Promise to the Chinese, written about God's promise in the Chinese language. The Chinese symbol for righteous is a person under a lamb. The only way to be righteous is to be under the lamb. Their own words were telling them. By the way, we have a lot of that in English. And that would make a good sermon someday, too. We'll get another time on that. Today, there are about 1,200 recognized languages, plus thousands and thousands of dialects. They probably all broke up from the original 75 languages, just like, you know, Australian, Irish, and Georgian, people from Georgia or Alabama. Believe it or not, they all speak English. But it's a different dialect of English, okay? And if it weren't for rapid communication across the world today, they would be totally indecipherable in a few generations. When we were in Australia, I was at the restaurant. I said to the waitress, I said, ma'am, would you get me a napkin? The preacher said, don't, don't, don't say that. I said, why? He said, don't ask for a napkin over here. That's a diaper. I said, what do I want? He said, you want a serviette? I said, oh, okay. Ma'am, can I have a serviette? I thought I spoke English, you know. <laughs> they don't speak English over there. They speak Australian, all right. Uh, but the Bible says pretty clearly in Acts 17, God hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the earth. The Bible says in Malachi, have we not all one father? There's no reason to be a racist because of your skin color. We cover more on that on video five. They did a search for Adam and Eve, trying to find, you know, do we have a common ancestor? Using mitochondrial DNA changes, they found out we have a common ancestor only 200,000 years ago. One woman created this whole race, whole, you know, whole world. And then they did more studies on this mitochondrial DNA and said, wow, no, we all have a common ancestor only 6,000 years ago. And they said, no, that can't be right. Let's keep studying. Well, yeah, actually, we did have a common mother 6,000 years ago, and I even know her husband's name, mm -hmm. Okay, Adam, and a couple other kids' names. Uh, this, this article says, We all related to a man who lived in Asia, 1400 B.C., science correspondent in Weekly Telegraph in U.K. Everyone in the world is descended from a single person who lived around 3,500 years ago, according to a new study. Scientists worked out the most recent common ancestor of all 6 billion people alive today probably dwelt in Eastern Asia around 1400 B.C. Although the date may seem relatively recent, researchers say the findings should not come as a surprise. Anyone trying to trace their family tree soon discovers the number of direct ancestors doubles every 20 years. How many of you have two parents? How many of you have four grandparents? How many have eight Great-grandparents. How many have 16 great-great-grandparents? I mean, you go keep going back, you got a whole bunch of folks in a hurry, right? Well, this creates a problem. And the article says, it takes only a few centuries to clock up thousands of direct ancestors. Using a computer model, researchers from the Massachusetts MIT attempted to trace back the most recent common ancestor using estimated patterns of migration through history. And they found out we all came from a common ancestor three or 4,000 years ago. I could have told him that just by reading the Bible. Saved him a lot of time. Yep, we all have one common ancestor, Adam and Eve. Nothing to worry about. Okay, what about cloning? And the news a few years ago, cloning was a big deal. Is it okay to clone people? Well, there's quite a bit of uncertainty of what may happen with cloning. We're not sure exactly what you might end up with. You know, <laughs> half Hillary, half chimpanzee. But uh, the DNA is an incredibly complex molecule. Unbelievably complex. What they're doing with cloning is they're transplanting <clears throat> the DNA from one cell to another cell. They're not creating DNA. They're not creating any information. They're not creating anything new. They're just moving it from one cell to another. <clears throat> so they're not... It's a neat genetic trick. Very interesting and very complicated and very expensive, but they're not really creating anything. The DNA in your body is phenomenal. We cover all that on video number four about the complexity of DNA. Now Dolly, as far as we know, was the first uh, creature cloned, first mammal cloned. There were 277 failures before they got Dolly to work. It cost them $50,000 for that one sheep. They said, what do you think about cloning? I said, man, the sheep can do this a whole lot quicker and cheaper. You know, just leave them alone in the pasture and you'll have your baby sheep, okay? It's not, not that complicated. And Dolly aged much faster than normal and died early. Okay. Cloning is, is happening all over. I think it's a waste of time and money. Interesting research. I'm not against research. I'm not against science, but I think it's a waste of time. 
And if the theory is we're going to clone humans so that we can have organs to harvest to save us from diseases, now you've got a really expensive fix to most diseases which are a really simple cure. Vitamins, minerals, nutrition. We cover that on our videotape, The Bible and Health. And uh, Amy asked me, Sir Brother Hovind, would you please cover in your Q&A what vitamins you take? I take all kinds of vitamins and we cover all of that in our Bible and Health video. I don't want to get into all that on Q&A, but get our Bible and Health video, get all kinds of nutrition tips and vitamin tips. I'm sure no expert on it, but I do intend to live in this body the rest of my life, and I'm you know, going to make that my goal. So <clears throat> this question I get asked in a debate one time, this atheist said, Hovind, if God made a perfect world, why did he make poisonous snakes? Good, fair question. There's no question there's a lot of poisonous snakes. And what about mosquitoes? You know, didn't they, uh, didn't they bite Adam and Eve? Wouldn't that be painful? Wasn't there pain in the Garden of Eden? You know, what about poisonous spiders, etc.? Fair, honest, legitimate questions. Well, uh, if you get this article from JARS, Jungle Aviation and uh, Radio Service, you'll see where they talk about using electricity to treat snake bites. Dr. Roger uh, Guderian in western Ecuador treated 300 cases of snake bite. The pain is gone in 15 minutes if shock is applied within 30 minutes. What they do is they use a stun gun, makes a little electric spark. If you get bit by a poisonous snake or a poisonous spider, they've discovered over the last 20 years, a lot of research has been done, a spark right on the injury site will neutralize the poison. They say if you get bit by a snake, do it in an X pattern, once this way, once this way. If it's been more than 30 minutes, Tie an electrode to one of the, hook a wire to one of these and make a long wire and go around the other side so the spark has to go through the limb. If it's been more than 30 minutes, you probably should also spark halfway from the injury to the heart because the poison's traveling. Uh, a friend of mine said they had a lady come visit their place in Texas and the, they had a two-year-old two -year boy with them. The two-year-old got bit by a brown recluse spider, which can kill a two-year-old. Wouldn't kill a human, but it'd make you hurt for a long time. We got brown recluse right here in Pensacola. This little brown recluse spider bit this two-year-old right on the thigh. Within a few minutes, it was swelled up as big as a softball and rock hard and red with a spot in the middle. The kid is screaming uncontrollably. This friend of mine uh, talking to this lady and she said, what do I do? He said, I'll tell you what I would do. I'd shock it with a stun gun. He said, I happen to have one, but I'm no doctor. I'm not going to give you medical advice. But if you want to borrow my stun gun, I would shock it twice in an X pattern. Well, she did on this two-year-old. Within probably 30 seconds, he quit crying. In less than a minute, the swelling was going down. And in three minutes, he was back out playing. And in 15 minutes, you couldn't tell anything except the bite, little, little spot. I was out working in a uh, yard by the drinking fountain. And there, I was down there going to pull the weeds out under that drinking fountain. And uh, there's a wasp nest down there. I didn't know that. One of them came out, zap, stung me on the finger. So I went right upstairs to the Van de Graaff generator. 500,000 volt, make your hair stand up generator. Flip the switch, zap, zap, zap. Instantly, I, I mean, less than a half a second, the pain was gone from the wasp sting. I couldn't believe it. Just bam, gone. Just that quick, just electric spark. If you're, you know, people that uh, work in jungles, they're saying, look, get a spark. I mean, if you got to go to find an engine with a spark plug, you know, pull the wire off, spark it, chainsaw, lawn, lawnmower, do something, but spark it right away. There seems to be really therapy in high voltage treatment of spider bites. There's been articles since 1991, a lot of research done on this. So why did God make poisonous snakes? I don't think they were poisonous in the original creation. Carl Ball, for instance, in Glen Rose, Texas, raised uh, cotton, cotton mouth water moccasins in his hyperbaric chamber with a stronger electromagnetic field. After two weeks of being in strong magnetic field, the snakes were not poisonous. The poison was not harmful. So you can study more on that. Water moccasins raised in hyperbaric conditions will not be poisonous. So maybe the pre-flood world, uh, these snakes had a different function because the protein they inject is actually nutritious. It's good for you. There's a lady over here at Calvary Baptist. I think you spoke in there, Eric, on Pine Forest Road. She was in a car accident, hit the windshield, broke her neck down deep inside her, between her shoulder blades. She goes in once a month, still today, for an injection of cobra venom. They take the venom from a cobra, stick it down on her neck, and give her a shot because it's a nutritious protein. I don't know what they did to it. You could ask her if you'd like. But So maybe the snakes had a beneficial function. And so to say, hey, we have rattlesnakes, therefore God is mean, is to totally misunderstand the creation concept. Okay, what about the Ark of the Covenant? The Bible says in Jeremiah, 
that they took the spoons, the cups, the basins, the candles. It names all kinds of small things that were taken captive out of Israel. Then in Ezra, when they're bringing the stuff back, it mentions all the small stuff they brought, the knives, the, you know, the silverware. Why wouldn't it mention the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in the book of Chronicles, it says Uzziah uh, had prepared great machines and slings to sling stones, huge catapults, engines, cunning engines built by smart guys, were up on the, the walls to fling stones. They built all kinds of catapults, and you're going to attack that city, you're going to have a rock hit you on the head kind of stuff, all right? Well, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to besiege Jerusalem and take over the city, but he didn't want his soldiers getting hit by those rocks. So they calculated how far the rocks could go and built a wall outside the range of those catapults. We're going to build a wall all the way around the city and we're going to starve them out. The siege had begun. And you can read all about that in all the book of, you know, in the Old Testament about the siege around Jerusalem. Well, Jeremiah had said, uh, the nation and kingdom that will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish. God told Jeremiah, go tell everybody in the city, surrender. I want these guys to win. You have been evil, you are wicked, and this is your punishment. Don't fight them. Go with them. Be their slaves. The king said, no, we're going to fight them. And they got slaughtered, okay, wiped out. Well, Jeremiah knew they were going to lose because God had told him you're going to lose. So apparently Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant and the temple furniture from the temple outside the city. There's a tunnel called Jeremiah's Passageway that's caved in in several spots. Richard Reeves, who worked with Ron Wyatt, has been working on this for years, digging out this tunnel. Some places are still open. But uh, there's all kinds of tunnels under Jerusalem. I mean, the, there's another city under that city. Okay? And who knows what hasn't been discovered. But apparently they took the Ark of the Covenant and all this temple furniture outside the city wall, but inside the siege wall. Well, if you look at where that arrow is pointing, that is Golgotha, the place where Jesus was crucified. The garden tomb is right there. I was there a couple years ago. I'm going again in the spring back to Jerusalem. Oh, it's incredible. If you get a chance to go to the Holy Land, get over there. It's called the Place of the Skull. Jeremiah's Grotto is now a place where they store bananas. A couple of Muslims own it, and they store, store fruit there to sell. But apparently in Jeremiah's Grotto, all this, you can see at the place of the skull where they stone Stephen, the garden tomb, the uh, Cal Gordon's Calvary. Jesus was crucified right there. He was buried just a short distance away in the tomb. And we get into more later on the, the crucifixion site. But Ron was digging in that area, Ron uh, Wyatt, who died in 99. And his, you can get all of his uh, discoveries from our ministry. There's only, I think, two people that sell his DVDs, him and us. hundred bucks for his DVD series. It's phenomenal. If you want to watch, there's what, Paul, Paul, five DVDs, I think. Or, yeah. If you want to get all of Ron Wise's discoveries, you can see more about this. Just contact our ministry, hundred bucks, and get it. But Ron said he was digging outside there in Jeremiah's Grotto area, and he, they found, these, they found the, the crucifixion site. He covers it all on the DVDs. And they found this little cave. I had a Muslim friend working with him, helping him dig dirt. You know, he just paid this guy, Arab, to dig. He was squeezing down in this little hole, digging around, and he came out screaming, I quit, I quit, and left. So Ron went in there, and according to Ron, I talked to him for hours about it. And he said, Brother Hovind, if you told me this story, I wouldn't believe you, but it happened to me, and I know that all liars have their part in the lake of fire. Ron, I knew Ron personally. I think he was a good man. If I was God, I would let him find this kind of stuff because he wasn't looking for glory. He was looking to glorify God. So other people, other Christians and other, even good friends of mine say, oh, Ron's wrong. He's, you know, I get, all, I get blasted for even mentioning Ron. And Eric, you and I, men, are on our video series, uh, Creation Science, uh, Answering the Critics. We cover some of that in this DVD series, if you want to get all those DVDs about our answers to the critics. But Ron said he squeezed down in this little hole, and there's a little cave about four feet high, and he saw several things in there. As he looked around with his flashlight, he found, for instance, the table of showbread the golden table that the Jews had built 3,000 years ago. Jeremiah hid that stuff in there, built a false wall in front of it. And there's this concrete box, like a concrete, but it's actually a rock hollowed out. And when the lid was broken, according to Ron, he went over there and he looked at this lid and he couldn't see in it because the ceiling's too short. But all over this lid was a black stuff like dried ketchup. It turned out to be dried blood, according to Ron. Right above the crack in the lid was a crack in the ceiling of this little short cave. That crack in the ceiling went all the way up to where Jesus was crucified, 20 feet straight up through solid rock. All this is according to Ron. I've never seen that. But there's other folks who say, yep, that's correct. I mean, I don't know, but it, it preaches good at least. 
Apparently, Jesus died on the cross and His blood ran right down onto the mercy seat, which is where the blood was supposed to go when there was a sacrifice. Because Jeremiah had stuck it there 600 years earlier. And the blood ran right down to the mercy seat. Now, Uzzah put forth his hand and touched the ark and God killed him. So when Ron told the Jewish authorities, hey, here's your ark, they said, oh, we're not going to touch that. They said, it's still there, waiting for the new temple to be built. Then they're going to get it out and put it in the temple. So you can go to WyattMuseum.com and talk to Richard. He, he'll just say, I saw it. Richard will say, I don't know. This is what Ron said. And that's, that's best I can do too. Okay. Is God's name in Jerusalem? Hickory Hammock Baptist Church over here in Milton, Florida, Pastor Carl Gallup's a good friend of mine. I've spoken there a couple times. He's got a great sermon on this topic, and you ought to get a hold of him to get that. Is God's name in Jerusalem? Well, the Hebrew alphabet has all these different letters in it. One of them looks kind of like a W. It's called the Shin. That is the Hebrew word, the Hebrew, the, that one letter is the symbol for God. Whenever, and a lot of Hebrews put this on their doorpost or beside their house. They put the Shin, you know, this God, God's house, okay? God said, His name will be upon the children of Israel. He will put my name there forever, 1 Kings chapter 9. In Jerusalem will I put my name. In Jerusalem I will put my name forever, 2 Kings 21. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Is God's name actually in Jerusalem? Apparently so, because there are three valleys that form a shin. His name is permanently stamped there on this city. So that, that preach is good. I don't know. Okay, what about Bigfoot? I get asked the question all the time, hey, what about Bigfoot? Bigfoot lives. Deal with it. Chester Moore Jr. is a good friend of mine from the Houston area. I spoke at their cryptozoology conference. What about Bigfoot? How about the making of Bigfoot? This is the guy in this book saying, I dressed up as Bigfoot, I confess it was me. And he still got the Bigfoot suit. I have interviewed 10 people who swear they've seen a Bigfoot. Okay, Todd Jurassic's a good friend of mine, he's seen one several times. This film, the Patterson film here, is the one made by the guy who confessed it was him in the suit. All right? Matter of fact, there's a, the Bigfoot suit, not the original, but a copy of it, is coming to Dinosaur Adventureland, going to be in our museum here soon. There's a guy in Colorado who's donating it to our museum. But what about Bigfoot? Uh, I don't know. Whatever these creatures are, some are certainly hoaxes and fakes and frauds, no question. Okay, but they've been seen in just about every state. There are several theories about Bigfoot since I've interviewed 10 people who've seen one, and because the question comes up, I'm going to answer it, but it's not something I deal with. I deal with creation. Here are the theories. Some people say they're all hoaxes or misidentified. Well, hoaxes, certainly that happens, but you've got to be understanding, especially in the South here, who in their right mind is going to run around dressed up in the woods like that? How many rednecks are there within 30 miles of here that shoot one of them things on sight? Look at that thing moving. Bam! What is it? Oh, I don't know, George. Let's go check it out. You know, that's just shoot first, ask questions later. You know, that's just the way it is, all right? The second theory says they're unidentified species of ape. That could be true. This is a Discovery Channel last night had a section on, you know, what is this Bigfoot stuff? Some people think they're some of the hippies from the 60s that haven't come in yet. They're hairy and they stink, okay? I don't know. Some people think they're aliens from another world. I don't know about that one. Some people think they're simply genetic experiments gone bad. The bottom line is, I don't know, but those are the current theories that I'm aware of. So if you see one, let me know. I'd like to hear about it. Genesis chapter 6 says, There were giants in the earth in those days. Well, who were these giants? It came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. The sons of God, which always refers to angels in the Old Testament, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. His day shall be 120 years. And I don't know what that means. If anybody knows, let me know. People have argued, see, nobody's going to live past 120. Well, that's not true. There's a lot of folks that have lived past 120. Some people say it's going to be 120 years till the flood. I don't know. Maybe it means there's going to be 120 jubilee years of human history. Every 50 years was the year of jubilee. 120 times 50 is 6,000. I don't know. If you know, let me know, but I don't. But, but anyway, back to the giants. It says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Who were these giants? And is this giants referring to the mighty men? Or does the phrase, after that, separate this into two totally unrelated subjects? I can't figure it out. Somebody knows. Please let me know. But the Bible says God saw the wickedness of man and He said, I'm going to wipe him out, and He sent the flood. <clears throat> but who were these giants and who were these mighty men? It's the Hebrew word Nephilim. Who were the Nephilim? 
Well, some people think that Jude, verse 6, it's only got one chapter, they think Jude, verse 6, ties in. Angels which kept not their first estate. I think that ties in also, but I have no idea why I believe that, other than that's what I've been taught all my life. But I think it's always wise to question and say, well, is this really, does this tie in? Other people think uh, Peter, the Peter passage ties in. First Peter says, the spirits in prison waited in the days of Noah. Are these spirits in prison and the angels that kept not their first estate and the giants, is this referring to the same thing? I'm going to give that a definite probably, but I don't know how you could prove such a thing. Here are the theories about these Nephilim. Some people think they're sons of God that are fallen angels that, you know, followed Satan and they married the daughters of men. The problems with that theory is angels don't marry in heaven. That doesn't mean they can't marry on earth. And it assumes that Revelation 12 means a third of the angels followed Satan. You guys going through Bible college, why do we always teach a third of the angels followed Satan? The passage in Revelation says, Satan drew a third of the stars with his tail. That's it. That's the only verse they're using to say a third of the angels followed Satan. There's no question Satan has helpers and demons and all that stuff, but we're, I don't think the Bible tells us. So either we don't need to know, or it just simply doesn't matter. But don't worry about it. There's not enough information. The second theory says it's the sons of God referring to the line of Seth, and they're marrying the kid, the Cain's descendants, intermarrying of the godly and ungodly line. I think that's a ridiculous theory because saved and unsaved people get married all the time and it doesn't affect their children as far as they don't become giants because one's saved and one's lost, okay? Secondly, there's no evidence Seth's children were godly. I mean, they all drowned in the flood too, except for one of them, Noah. Noah had brothers and sisters that drowned in the flood. It says Lamech lived after he begat Noah so many years and begat sons and daughters. Noah's own cousins didn't come on the ark. Brothers and sisters didn't. Chuck Mister's got a good uh, audio tape series about the Nephilim. If you want to read, listen, study more on that. He thinks not only were they, you know, genetic experiments, but they're coming back. And Satan's going to use this again to infl infiltrate humanity. You can get Chuck Missler's stuff on that. But whatever these Nephilim were, it would appear to me that Noah's kids would have seen them. Genesis 6, the first five verses, is talking taking place just before the flood. And so God said to Noah, build the ark and we're going to have a flood. So this Nephilim is referred to before the flood. So let's assume that they were giant people with supernatural powers of some kind. Noah's kids would have seen them. After the flood's over, they're going to tell stories to their kids sitting around the campfire. Oh, you should have seen the guy that lived down the street from us. Man, oh man, he had three eyes and could fly or who knows, you know. But these stories are going to be preserved through the flood by Noah's children and they're going to be come the legends of Zeus and Thor and all the Babylonian and Greek and all the mythological gods probably are actually stretched stories and maybe even not stretched stories of true things that happen. So probably this is a result of the Nephilim. But there's an awful lot of stuff about these giants in the earth in those days and maybe that's what it is. You study it for yourself. Next question, what about UFOs, unidentified flying objects? What are they? I don't know, and I'm not sure how it ties into creation, but since I get asked that every week, I'll tell you my humble, totally unbiased thoughts on the topic, okay? What are the UFOs, unidentified flying objects? I like that picture, you know, took off his glasses. I have been to New Mexico to the UFO Museum several times. Every time I go through that area and preach, I stop in and see the UFO Museum. It's pretty interesting. It's a huge place with all kinds of interesting stuff and hundreds and hundreds of books that have been written about UFOs. Gulf Breeze right down here, six miles away, is famous for its UFO sightings. So what are the UFOs? There have been many Christian books written on the topic and many heathen books written on the topic. We have uh, these two, uh, UFO, End Time Delusion, and a kind of Reader's Digest smaller version by the same author, condensing, condensing the information, UFO 666. There's a great book uh, by Chuck Missler again called Alien Encounters, if you want to read his theory on UFOs. And he's one of the smartest guys I know. There's a... Uh, I asked Chuck Missler a few months ago when I was preaching out there at a conference with him. I said, Dr. Missler, what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico? What is the truth about this? You know, the UFO crash site. He said, Brother Hovind, I don't know for sure, and nobody who knows is talking. But exactly nine months later, Al Gore was born. So <laughs> what happened? I, I don't know that'll preach, but Stan Dale has a good book. He lives in Colorado Springs. Stan Dale's book about the cosmic conspiracy is real good on the top. He says it's using a, new, uh, uh, 
a little understood form of propulsion called electrogravitic propulsion. And I mentioned this in a seminar years ago, and a guy came to me and he said, Brother Hovind, I work for the government, and uh, how do you know about electrogravitic propulsion? That's top secret. I said, I read a book about it. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> That's the book if you want to read it. Still available from millennium-arc.net. So, round airplanes have been made for years. This is the uh, XF-5U, which flew very well but uh, during World War II at the end. But they invented jet engines and they kind of became obsolete. Here's the A-15. The Russians had a similar one called the A-16, a round airplane, a, a frisbee. Okay, The V-173 flew just fine. So there are several theories about UFOs. Let me just give them to you. Since I don't know, I'll tell you what you can study for yourself. One theory says they're all misidentified. Somebody saw a weather balloon, swamp gas, a mirage, too much vodka, whatever. Okay. Second theory says they're top secret or government or private experiments. And third theory says they're satanic or demonic. See, God is all places. Satan can only be one place. So he flies a UFO according to that third theory. Okay, He has to be able to get around quickly. If they travel with electrogravitic propulsion, then there would be no G-force because every molecule is being drawn electrically. So the craft could go from zero to 5,000 and stop on a dime and the people inside would not be bouncing around. No G-force. People describe the UFOs as, you know, up, down, right, left, zip, 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 you know, things that would kill a person inside a regular plane. You know, pilots black out too much G-force. The fourth theory says they're alien life from other planets. Now, the Bible says Eve's the mother of all living, so I have a hard time believing there's life on other planets. I think there's angels out there, you know, seraphim, cherubim, if you mean life outside of earth, and that I, I would agree with. But as far as other, you know, uh, living beings outside of that, I don't believe there's any life anywhere else. Next question. How long were they in the Garden of Eden before they sinned? The Bible says Adam was 130 when a son was born. Before that, Cain and Abel were born, but the dates aren't given because they're not in the line to Jesus Christ. So I think they could have been in the Garden 100 years. I don't know, but I don't think they sinned the first 30 seconds. At the end of day 6, God said everything was very good. Adam and Eve had not sinned yet, and Satan had not fallen yet. It's not logical to say Satan fell before the sixth day of creation. Because God said everything was very good. But God drove man out and put him at the east of the Garden of Eden and put some angels and cherubims there and says, don't come back. So I don't think uh, they were in the Garden of Eden. They had to be out before Cain and Abel were born and before Seth was born. So it could have been 100 years. There's no way to tell. But certainly sometime after day 7, before 100 years, I'm just picking that as a number, they were in the Garden of Eden. Okay. What about the mark of the beast? We'll cover much more on this on our college class, uh, CSE 200 series, but the Bible says they're going to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead, and you cannot buy or sell without this mark. I have studied this a lot. I'm sure no expert, but I believe we've already got it available today, this little microchip about the size of a grain of rice that's been developed for 20 years now. They've been 15 or 20 years they've been using this. Uh, Dean Martin, some of you might have been here when Dean lives right here in town, came to speak to our staff about the microchip. He took one of these little chips, put it under his arm, and walked past his laptop computer, which had a little sensor built into it. Are you here for that, Diane? And up on the screen flashed his name, address, phone number, social security number, birth date. The chip doesn't store any of that. The chip stores a code that triggers the computer to find all that. They've, there's already, it's already, technology is already here to make a little chip that's just a tr transponder. A radio frequency goes out, re the radio frequency goes out, energizes the chip, which has no battery, the antenna picks up the energy and sends back, you know, here's my number. I am number, you know, 325C95, whatever. Exxon gas station, you can buy these called Speed Pass. You walk up, pump your gas, touch the pump, get in your car and drive off. McDonald's is doing this. You carry a little chip on a keychain. You walk up, touch the McDonald's cash register, pay for your food. Anybody ever seen that before? It's been available for five or six years, okay? This article came out in CNN. Is human chip implant wave of the future? Years ago, people have been putting chips in themselves to activate their whole house. Kevin Warwick's really big on this. When he walks into the room, the light comes on. His whole house is computerized, and it's all based on a chip that he's got in his arm. So it can be done. Hitachi Corporation developed a new Mu chip, which only holds 128 bits. But that's the size of it right there. 0.4 millimeters. You can put it inside a piece of paper and not find it. There's a family in Florida a couple years ago who was real proud of themselves. They put microchips in because they have health problems. And in case they get you know, uh, 
hurt in an accident, they can scan their body and find out, oh, this is George, he's got hemophilia, whatever, you know. There's a little chip there, you can see the antenna, which receives the radio signal. That signal energizes the antenna, which activates it to send back its signal. It gets its energy from an outside source. Well, Carl Sanders has a whole bunch of stuff on this microchip technology. You can get a hold of him in Arkansas if you want. Uh, put his website up here. But as far as using money, the Bible says the love of money, root of all evil. This microchip technology is going to be used to develop uh, one world currency. All cash is going to become obsolete. You're going to have to have a chip in your hand or in your forehead or you cannot buy or sell. And we are racing toward that technology, racing toward that reality right now. I don't know how much longer it's going to be, but I'll be surprised if we go five more years without cash, credit cards, every, everything being eliminated. You have to have a chip. I don't think there's going to be a grand moment when Christians can stand up and say, you're not giving me that chip, you know, I'm going to go stand up for God. It's just going to be a simple matter of you get slowly choked out of society. Well, you just can't buy here. Okay, sorry, we don't take cash, we don't take credit cards, we don't take, all we take is you got to have a chip. It's going to solve a lot of problems and create a lot of problems, which ties in probably to the HARP technology, High Altitude Aurora Research Project, H-A-A-R-P. They've been doing research for years trying to use the high aurora, the aurora where the northern lights are, to control weather. There's a lot of folks and a lot of stuff on the Internet thinking that probably these hurricanes in the last couple of years have been controlled deliberately. By sending up microwave frequencies, they can heat up a section of the sky and make a virtual lens and then therefore use the sun's light coming through that lens to heat up the ground like you burn ants with your magnifying glass, you know. High altitude aurora research project. They can make a virtual mirror with this stuff. How much is real? I don't know. It's an interesting study. They use ELF, extra low frequency, and you can get into all that if you'd like. There's been a ton of research done on this, and there's a lot of strange things up in Alaska and up around the North Pole that apparently are for this purpose. They drill a hole in the ground. Everything seems to be below ground, probably for multiple reasons. I was at a debate here recently, and somebody said, well, doesn't the Shroud of Turin prove that Jesus Christ lived on earth? Well, I don't need the Shroud of Turin to prove Jesus lived on earth, but what about the Shroud of Turin? Somebody sent me this book and said, oh, Brother Hovind, you've got to read this. This is proof that Jesus was buried in the burial cloth, you know, proof of death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Well, they say the Shroud of Turin was the cloth Jesus was buried in. Now, here's the facts about it. This is a picture of it. You can see the picture of the face and the arms are crossed and, you know, they say the holes in the, in the hands where he was, you know, crucified and holes in the feet. And you can see the beard and all this stuff. There's several real serious problems with the Shroud of Turin. They say you can see the outline of his beard and his wounds. Well, the Bible says his face was bound about with a napkin. The piece around his head was different than the piece around his body. In John chapter 20, it says, Peter went in and saw the linen clothes lie and the napkin about his head, not lying with the clothes, but in a place by itself. The Shroud of Turin has one cloth covering the head and the body. It's not the burial cloth of Jesus. They saw the linen clothes lie by themselves, Luke chapter 24. Isaiah prophesied, that they would pluck off his hair. Well, the Shroud of Turin shows a man with a beard. He didn't have a beard. By the time he got buried, they had plucked off the hair of his cheeks, okay? First Corinthians says it's a shame for man to have long hair. This guy had long hair. At least the image does, okay? Jesus did not have long hair. He was not a Nazarite. He was from Nazareth, okay? The custom of that day was to have short hair. If the custom was to have short hair, then why did Judas have to kiss him to pick him out of the crowd? If Jesus had long hair, he could just say, hey, he's the long-haired guy, go get him. No, Jesus had short hair like everybody else, okay? So, Jesus went secretly uh, to the feast. Nobody picked him out as unusual. He looked just like everybody else, okay? He was not a Nazarite from Numbers chapter 6. That was a vow they took not to cut their hair, shave, and all that stuff. Samson was a Nazarite. Jesus was from Nazareth. <laughs> Don't get the two confused, okay? It's no connection whatsoever. So, the Shroud of Turin is a really old cloth. It might even be a cloth somebody was buried in. It might even be a cloth somebody who was crucified was buried in. I wouldn't argue any of that. But it's not Jesus. That's for sure. Okay. When my son Eric was in Bible college, he had a teacher there that taught him the word created and made are different words. And this was used as evidence for the gap theory. Some things God created, some things God made. So I went through and searched the scriptures like you're supposed to do and found out God made the heaven and earth, but it also says he created heaven and earth. The words are used interchangeably. He made the firmament in Genesis 1-7, but he created the firmament in Psalm 148. 
All through Scripture, it uses these words interchangeably, created and made. It's called Hebrew parallelism. If we do the same in English. If you're going to describe something, you wouldn't use the same word twice. You wouldn't say, wow, he was huge, he was huge. You would say, wow, he was huge, he was big. You pick a new word for emphasis. Created and made are used interchangeably all through scriptures. The Bible says the Lord made the heavens, 1 Corinthians. He made the trees, but He also created the trees. He made man, He also created man. He made the land animals, and he, or made the land, animals for the land, and He created animals for the land. All through scripture, He uses them interchangeably. Some of them have been the very same verse. In Genesis 2, 4, God said, let us make man in our image, so He created man in His own image. Right in the same verse. I mean, no, it's not anything you could use to, uh, to justify the gap theory or uh, ruined creation, ruined restoration theory. The Hebrew word created is bara, and formed is yatsar, and made is asa. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing them right, I don't speak Hebrew. But here they're used all in the same verse. Every, Isaiah 43, everyone, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Got them all in the same verse. I mean, it can't be more clear. It's talking about the same thing. I created thee, O Jacob, that, and he that formed thee, O Israel. I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Again, it's for emphasis. Not enough to make a whole doctrine on. So these words, you know, uh, form, create, made, are used interchangeably all through Scripture. It's just simply for emphasis. So where do you take courses on creation? Well, we offer some courses on creation. There are several good people who supply materials on creation. Landmark Freedom Baptist Curriculum in Florida has got some good stuff down near where you live, Josh. I don't know if you've been down there. Haines City, Florida, south of Orlando a little bit. They've got good stuff. Don Boys, my good friend up in, Ar in uh, Georgia, has some. Jill Whitlock, HomeTrainingSchools.com, if you train your kids at home on stuff on creation. Charles Lynn, up in Tennessee, took my seminar and made a ch children's course out of it, a curriculum that you can get from him. This is a question I get asked in debates all the time. Hoven, you call yourself Dr. Hoven. By the way, I rarely do that, okay? I'm just Kent, okay? But I do have a PhD, and they say, where do you get, where, is your PhD legitimate? Well, I think you've got a right to face your, face your accusers. I say, whoever's spreading the information about a PhD, would you please stand? And they don't stand, of course. I, I'm always answer, ready to answer questions. But whenever somebody says, you don't have a legitimate degree, right away I know they're really, it's called an ad hominem attack. They're attacking the person instead of the message. So I do take it a little cautiously. Do you have a legitimate degree? Well, they're trying to draw attention away from their silly religion of evolution. <clears throat> PhD means doctorate of philosophy. That's what it means. Do I have one? Yes, I do. There's a picture of it. It's hanging on the wall right inside if you want to go look at it. Patriot University started uh, 18, 1980 in Colorado Springs. It was a Baptist church that started this university. It's a Christian school, kind of like you guys went to the Christian school up here in Pensacola. Nothing wrong with that. They have about 30 graduates a year. You can give, give them a phone call if you want. They were at Hilltop Baptist Church for years. They had uh, 25 graduates a year. About three got doctor's degrees. They offered doctor's degrees and they offered PhDs. They have now changed their name to Patriot Bible University. That was done just in the last few years. It used to be just simply Patriot University when I went there, okay? They offered a PhD in education. I took it. I got it. It took me nine years to finish it. I worked hard for my degree. I don't know if people work hard for theirs or not. But if you don't like the doctor's degree, then call me Bubba, call me Kent, call me Hey You, and let's get back to the topic, okay? It's not a big deal with me. Before I finished my last course, I sat down, put the course away, thought about it for two weeks. Do I really want to finish this? Is this degree, is the word term doctor going to help or hurt my ministry? I just want to win souls and influence people, that's all. And I really wrestled with, should I even finish it? For fear that it might be a hindrance instead of a help. And I finally did. I ended up with two PhD, a PhD and a doctorate in uh, divinity. I have a doctor's divinity and doctor and a PhD in education. Uh, religious education, nothing wrong with that whatsoever, but if you don't like the degree, then okay, don't call me. They call it the Patriot a Diploma Mill. It is not a diploma mill. You can contact them yourself, okay? I worked pretty hard for my degree. I don't know if they worked hard for theirs or not. About 25 graduates a year. So yes, I have a PhD. And Darwin's degree was in um, theology, but they call him a scientist, okay? Henry Morris has a great article about people. Charles Darwin was an apostate divinity student whose only degree was theology. Alfred Russell had little formal education with only a brief apprenticeship in surveying, and yet they say he was a great scientist. Uh, Jean uh, Lamarck is the only one that had a real degree. 
Ernst Haeckel in Germany seemed to have a bona fide education in, in the branch of evolutionary science that they pursued. Those are the only two guys. But most people that are involved in evolution in the early days uh, were surveyors or engineers and had nothing to do with uh, uh, biology. Yet we call them the fathers of uh, evolution. I do have an earned PhD from a non-accredited Christian university. I've always said that. Thousands of major world leaders throughout history had no degrees of any kind. Thousands of major universities offered degrees by distance learning via the internet, correspondence. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't ever have to show up on campus. Uh, thousands of people who attend classes in universities cheat, lie, or bribe their way to get a degree. I didn't do any of those, okay? Getting a degree from an accredited university does not guarantee any level of intelligence. I mean, most of them still believe they came from a rock, for heaven's sake, okay? <clears throat> if you don't like my degree, then call me Cantor Bubba and let's get back to the topic. If I were dumb or desperate, I could travel to universities around the world and take pictures of where their actual degrees are from. I was at Rutgers University and I saw a little closet under a stairwell. It's a converted closet where they handle their correspondence for those that are getting degrees in, I don't know, Chinese or something. Nobody does it, so they got one or two students or you know, who knows how many. So they, they, you don't need a whole university for that degree because there's just nobody's doing it. So the fact that it's a little closet under a stairwell, does that prove uh, it's not legitimate? <laughs> no. Come on, grow up, get a life. Okay, I think uh, you, can, you can have a degree. Atheists occasionally ask the question, if, if the entire army of Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea, why haven't we found any evidence? Where's the evidence for these guys drowning in the Red Sea? And it's a fair question, okay? Many atheists ask very fair questions, and it's time Christians be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in you. And I'm sorry this taping has gone so long for part seven, but there's a lot of questions that get asked. And we do many more on our uh, radio series, radio program every day from 4.30 to 6 central time. You can call in on truthradio.com or drdino.com. But in Exodus chapter 14, God told Moses to go and camp by the sea. And it says they went across on dry ground and the waters were a wall beside them. It does not say they walked through a reed sea. There are some even liberal Christians that say, oh yeah, they just walked through shallow water. Well, then how did Pharaoh's army drown? You tell everybody, lay down, don't get up. Okay, <laughs> I mean, come on. It was dry ground. And the Bible says God took off their chariot wheels. So what's the truth about the Red Sea crossing? It says the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. If you look at the country of Egypt in the lower right hand corner of this map, you'll see Egypt has the Red Sea right beside it. <clears throat> it comes up into two branches, the one on the left called the Gulf of Suez, where the Suez Canal is, the one on the right called the Gulf of Aqaba. Actually, there are two parts to the Red Sea. It splits right there around what's called the Sinai Peninsula, which by the way is not Sinai, no, Sinai is not there. But the children of Israel were leaving Egypt and it took Pharaoh three days to catch them. They could not have crossed the Gulf of Suez. They went all the way across the Sinai Peninsula and crossed over there on the right at the Gulf of Aqaba. Right where that red dot is next to the Gulf of Aqaba is actually a beach. <clears throat> There's a dry riverbed that runs right up to that beach and it's mountains on both sides and no escape any place. Certainly not with a bunch of people with their families, you know, kids and wagons and animals and stuff like that. You're not gonna get up either one of those mountain ranges. The satellite view is kind of from the north, a little strange view. There you can see that beach right there. The children of Israel went out of Egypt at the far upper right and traveled all the way across the Sinai Peninsula and ended up stuck on that beach. That beach is huge. Uh, those are little buildings, those little squares on there are actually warehouses and stuff. It's a monster beach, big enough to hold two or three million people, no problem. So here's the children of Israel stuck on the beach. They can't go north or south. There's mountains both ways. They can't go back. There's Pharaoh's army coming through the gap and they can't go ahead. There's a Red Sea in front of them. So what do you do? Well, you cry and blame God for your problems. That's what everybody does. Okay, <clears throat> God, I can't, can't get out of this. What do you do? Dry riverbed where they came out. At the south end of the beach, Ron Wyatt years ago found a pillar right there. He pulled the pillar out, scrubbed it off and set it up on concrete. And it was pretty badly eroded, but some of it was still legible. And it said in Paleo-Hebrew, apparently the pillar was erected by King Solomon. And it said, this is the pillar erected by King Solomon to commemorate the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, Gilbert Vincent's a good friend of mine from Texas. He's been there a couple times. He got a bulldozer and helped stand it up straight and put more dirt around it because it was kind of leaning over. He climbed up to the top of it. Right there at the, where this beach is, <clears throat> is a, it's about eight miles across the Red Sea. Well, at that point, there's a shallow spot, the deep uh, up toward the city of Elat, where I was a few years ago, uh, is about 5,000 feet deep on both sides. This whole 
all Gulf of Aqaba is about 5,000 feet deep except for right there. There's a shallow spot. I should probably say shallow. It's actually 900 feet deep. That's still pretty deep. But 900 feet over 8 miles is not bad. It's a gentle slope down, gentle slope back up. And if you go scuba diving, scuba diving down there, you'll see the rocks have been moved out of the way. Somebody cleared a path across the bottom of the Red Sea. Probably done by Moses and the people. The Bible says Pharaoh's army drowned trying to cross the Red Sea. The waters were a wall unto them. To walk eight miles would take, you know, half a day with all the children of Israel pulling their wagons and everything else. At the bottom, <clears throat> according to Ron Wyatt, he went scuba diving down there and found human bones, horses' hooves, chariot wheels. Now, there's some controversy about the chariot wheels, but this is what appears to be a chariot wheel, gold-plated. They said you can't pick it up. It's a gold veneer because it just crumbles. The wood's rotted out. It's like chrome plating on a car. If you put a bumper in the water, let the bumper rust out, just had the chrome, you couldn't pick it up. It would crumble, okay? But there are those who argue that's not legitimate. I don't know. But I'm just telling you what Ron told me, that there were real chariot wheels. When he took the pictures to the, Gulf, to the Antiquities Department in Egypt, they said, oh, wow, this is from the 18th dynasty. He said, how do you know that? They said, well, the 18th dynasty is the only one that used four, six, and eight-spoke chariot wheels, and all three were down there. So this was the same guys that chased Moses out of Egypt, the 18th dynasty. So <clears throat> that makes Mount Sinai over in Arabia. Because remember, they crossed the Red Sea and then they came to Mount Sinai. The Sinai Peninsula is not where Mount Sinai is. Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Right over there in that red section there is actually the holy precinct where Mount Sinai is. Galatians tells us Sinai is in Arabia. It says so in Galatians chapter 4. If Ron is right on all this, and I believe that he is, and you can see much more on his Discoveries uh, series, it's 100 bucks for five DVDs. That's how they fund their ministry to go back over there and do more research. Well worth getting. Uh, you can see this is apparently Mount Sinai. And there's video footage of all this. The top is still burned. Became a type of a volcanic glass like obsidian or something. It actually burned the rock. At the bottom, you can see the outline where the uh, border was set up. Because remember, Moses told the children of Israel, don't come up onto the mountain. And they put it, but says they established a border. Well, the pillars are still there. There's also apparently the altar that Aaron made with a golden calf. They you know, made the golden calf on the altar, but on the side of the altar, they drew a picture of a calf or cow. Still there. God told Moses to smite the rock and water would come out. Well, most of the Bible story picture books have you know, a little trickle of water coming out of a rock and somebody holding a cup. <laughs> How are you going to feed or water two million people and their animals with a trickle of water coming out of a rock? That's a stupid idea. Some of them show a little bitter picture. Actually, actually a little bigger picture of water. Actually, it's probably huge. A lot of folks think this is the rock that Moses smote. That rock sticking up on that mountain is five stories tall, 50 feet to the top of that rock, as tall as these trees around here, and it's split right down the middle. On both sides, there are erosion marks. Water came pouring out of that rock. So you can see the video series for Ron if you want more on that. And Sodom also, he's got a lot of stuff on his website and on his video series about Sodom and Gomorrah. The Dead Sea in Israel has five spots along there that are just real high salt concentration and totally destroyed landscape. Ron says he found, and I believe him, Sodom, Gomorrah, uh, Gera, uh, Gaza, Adma, Laboam. These were the ones that the cities that were destroyed. You can read through Genesis uh, chapter 14 and Deuteronomy chapter 29 and get more on this. But God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Apparently, Sodom and Gomorrah are right there along the south end of the Dead Sea right by Masada. When I was up on top of Masada a couple years ago, you can look down and see this big square in the ground where apparently it used to be a city. This picture shows what looks like uh, pilasters and, and towers and w of an ancient wall. Well, that's the way they built their cities back then. If you make it up over one wall, you got the enemy dumping arrows and hot oil and things down on you, you know, from the second wall. Not a good place to be. We have sulfur balls. I've got some here on the table. These are actual sulfur balls from Sodom and Gomorrah. They smell like sulfur. They're 99.9% .9 sulfur and they're burned out. Okay? If you break them open, some are still yellow inside. Most of them are pretty badly burned. Some of them are bigger, like golf ball size, but millions of these sulfur balls are over there, right in that one area. It literally rained burning sulfur. So hot that it took the bricks of the city and baked it into ash. Uh, these sulfur balls specimens were tested by Michael uh, Benilla, a friend of mine up in New York. He said they were 97.4% pure sulfur when he had them tested. No place else in the world has these phenomena. We've got hundreds of them in our museum out here. Sulfur balls from Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Apparently, the cities were actually burned up. If you dig into the ash, it looks like just a cliff of ash. That's actually the old city wall. I mean, that was the brick. Under 2,600 degree temperature, it turned into ash, laminated. You can talk to Richard. That's Richard in the picture there, digging his finger into the ash. And there's sulfur balls in there. We've got one that apparently is a part of a human bone that was baked. It's in our museum, if you want to see that one out there. So I believe, I believe they found Sodom and Gomorrah, and you can check the video, Discovery's videos if you want more on that. I often get asked, what about the unicorn? The Bible talks about a unicorn. What is it? Well, I don't know, but I'll give you the theories, okay? The Bible says he has the strength of a unicorn, Numbers 23. The strength of a unicorn, number 24, Numbers 24. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Can the, canst thou bind the unicorn? The Bible's teaching us here, the unicorn is strong. He is unwilling to be a servant. He, you can't tame him. And you, you don't, never, nobody ever harnesses him to plow your fields. You just can't do it. He's untamable. Wilt thou trust him because his strength is great? Wilt thou leave thy labor to him that he'll bring it home? No, he won't. Psalm says he can skip like a calf in Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. So the animal could skip. And it says in Psalm 92, the horn of a unicorn. This is one of the only references that makes people think the unicorn had one horn because it says the singular horn of the unicorn. I believe the unicorn is probably more like a one-horned dinosaur. I doubt it's a horse with a horn, but we've all heard that story all our lives, so we're not going to get that out of our system, okay? But if you had an uh, open mind and could look at this, you'd say, man, a lot of dinosaurs had a single horn, a monoclonius, a uh, Triceratops had three, but maybe they're only counting the center one. The other two might have been some other projection. I don't know. But anyway, I don't think the unicorn was necessarily a horse with a horn, probably more like a reptile, giant reptile. All right, question. Do wisdom teeth prove evolution? Well, Jack Cuazzo is a dentist from uh, New Jersey. He spoke at our boot camp here last year. Some of you got to hear Jack speak. Uh, this book, Buried Alive, is great about the Neanderthals. And wisdom teeth are not proof for evolution. They're actually proof that man used to live longer and grow bigger. Today, 60% of Americans have pr trouble with their wisdom teeth and have to have them removed or have problems with them, 60%. Many other countries don't have problems with their wisdom teeth because they've got a coarser diet and because of the rough stuff they chew and hard, more, you know, raw vegetables and stuff, their wisdom teeth come in when they're 18 or 20 with no problem. Today, we have a softer diet. 60% have trouble. But evolutionists argue that wisdom teeth are proof for evolution when actually they're proof that man used to be living longer, maturing slower, and growing bigger. If you're getting bigger by the time you're 18 or 20, as your head enlarges, it's time for that last tooth to come in to fill in the back of the jaw. Not proof for evolution. Just proof that man used to live longer. Question, why are some names missing in the Bible? Well, before we get into the, miss, the three missing names in the genealogy, uh, you need to understand the Bible says be careful about endless genealogies which minister questions, okay? It's pretty tough to follow some of the genealogies. But if you look at the genealogy in Genesis and Matthew and Luke, it gives the genealogy to Christ or part of the genealogy to Christ in Genesis. Luke, I took it and reversed the order because instead of saying which was the child of, which was the child of, Luke says which was the, uh, who was the father of, the father of, or, you know, it reverses the order. So I put them in reverse order here. And by the way, the two different genealogies after King David are following two of David's different sons, one to Mary, one to Joseph. One's the kingly line, one's the priestly line. That's why there's a difference there. But there's a guy in Luke's genealogy who's mentioned here named Canaan. Who was Canaan? Uh, Jack, uh, John, Jonathan Sarfati wrote an article about this on the Answers in Genesis website that says, this was a mistake. In the, he says, this is one of the few copyist errors in the Bible. And I, I love Jonathan. I'm glad for what he's doing. But I strongly disagree. And we wrote him a good article saying, Jonathan, you're wrong about this one. And did not get a, you know, a retraction or anything yet. But uh, the, 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 Canaan is one of three names that is in the genealogy, in some genealogy, genealogies, but not in other genealogies. Why was Canaan added? Well, if you go to our website, drdino.com, there's a long article explaining why Canaan was there. I asked Gail Ripplinger, who's a King James expert, I said, why is Canaan added? She said, oh, there's eight possible reasons. And she gave eight of them, and they're all on our website. But Genesis 5 does not mention Canaan. Luke chapter 3 does mention Canaan. So we put a long article about that rather than take an hour now and answer that. Just read that call if you have any questions. You can call to our radio program. But the Ammonites, it says in Ezekiel 21, their name would be remembered no more. There are some people taken out of the genealogies because they did things that were bad. Their name's going to be remembered no more. Ezekiel 25 talks about that. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever, Psalms chapter 9. The names of the idols, 
uh, out, of the, out of the land, and they shall no more, no more be remembered. Uh, the Bible tells us in Jude that Adam, Enoch, was the seventh from Adam. So there's no gap there. From Adam to Enoch, there's no gap. And it says Noah, the eighth person. I mean, the Bible gives us clues that tell us we can get pretty close on these genealogies. And I think the chart that we have uh, is correct. Now, there is a little discrepancy over how old Terah was when Abram was born. I'm aware of the discrepancy. Some people say Terah was 70. Some people say Terah was 130. 60 year difference. And we cover all that on our website also, uh, why we chose to use the 170 instead of the 130. But we got a good reason for that. So when did animals become carnivorous? Well, I don't know anybody who knows, but two options are, today obviously some animals eat meat. The Bible says in the creation everything ate plants. So when did that change? I don't know, but some people think it changed shortly after Adam's sin because once they fell, the world began, you know, thorns and thistles, and things might have changed right then. It might have changed after the flood when they got off the ark and had, you know, less food supply and more problems, and so they just, I don't know, got adapted to eating meat or something. But there's a lion that was used for years in the movie sets that uh, refused to eat meat, called Little Tyke. Lived to be, you know, I think nine years old, never ate meat in its life, refused. There's a whole a lady told me they've got a whole kennel full of dogs. Uh, they raise dogs, and she said, none of our dogs eat meat, all vegetables. During World War II, when meat was rare in Europe, they were feeding the zoo animals in London vegetables. That's all they had. They lived on cabbage. A guy sent me a videotape of two hours of grizzly bears in his front yard up in Canada eating grass, just grazing on grass for two hours. I don't want to edit in a two-hour video. It gets a little boring after a while. There's these grizzly bears <laughs> eating grass, okay? Yogi Bear likes to get a picnic basket if he can, but he'll settle for nuts and berries if he has to, okay? So that's why I don't think it's... Uh, something we can prove when it happened, but I suspect it happened before the flood came. They became carnivorous, or shortly after the flood. All right. People say, Brother Hovind, you get kind of sarcastic with the atheists, don't you? Yeah, I know, and I'm sorry. I'm working on it, but I'm not working on it too hard, okay? Here's why. We answer the skeptics. My son and I spent eight hours answering them, and we'll probably redo this someday. All the skeptics, there are nearly 2,000 anti hovind websites out there. So why do you answer them and be sarcastic? Well, in my 30-some years in the ministry, I have seen this evolution theory destroy the lives of thousands and thousands of kids. So I have a hard time being patient with those who are doing the destroying, especially when you know they're lying to support their theory. We cover that on video four. The Bible talks about beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit in Colossians chapter two. If I were attacking Hitler's death camps to rescue the Jews, I would have a hard time you know, being nice to the guards. I would probably want to shoot them and you know, <laughs> rescue, the, rescue the people. And I guess I have a little bit of a hard time when I go into universities 99 times now, I've debated professors, and I have a hard time, you know, look, you're the guy who's lying to these kids, destroying their faith, and I, you know, I respect them and I'm nice to them as nice as I can, but I do get kind of sarcastic. Here's why. The Bible says, smite a scorner and the simple will beware, Proverbs chapter 19. When a scorner's punished, the simple is made wise. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. In the book of 1 Kings, Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal. By the way, this is where rock music was invented. Come on, Baal, light my fire. He was singing, okay? Some of you old timers recognize that song. But here's, here's a preacher mocking the false prophets. Oh, you say, that's not very tolerant. That's correct. Not tolerant at all. You're not supposed to be tolerant of false prophets, okay? Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Oh, generation of vipers. He called them a bunch of snakes. You vipers, you're evil. He said you're a bunch of serpents and snakes. I mean, he's not being very tolerant of the other religions, is he? Okay. Jesus said, go tell Herod that fox. You're calling a political leader a fox? Yeah. I've called Bill Clinton and some of our presidents and leaders pretty bad names too, okay? I think you should if they're doing evil. Bible talks about the stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart, you full of all subtlety and mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, you pervert. I mean, the Bible's pretty strong, okay? All through the Bible, God calls people fools, brutish, simple, perverse, scorners, wicked, you know, stiff-necked, full of subtlety and evil, mischief, child of the devil. I'm just like to trying, to, trying to be like the Heavenly Father. That's why I'm sarcastic with these guys. <laughs> hey, look, you're lying or something else. So why don't I answer all the anti hoven websites? I've been challenged a hundred times to email debates. 
I'm not going to get into an email debate. I type 12 words a minute with 19 mistakes. I'm just not going to do that. Okay? All they want to do is tie up all my time. I've got a radio program every day that I pay for. Hour and a half, call in with your questions or instant message me, Dr. Dino Live, AOL Instant Message. We'll be glad to take your questions. One guy said, Brother Hovind, you are the most hated man in our chat room. I can't believe how many people talk about you. Apparently, you've struck a nerve. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Amen. So, I gladly answer any questions. I have question answer time every time I go speak. We offer this question answer video here. If you've got other questions, send them in. I have a standing offer to debate any evolutionist anywhere in front of their university. I'll pay them 200 bucks if they'll debate me and pay them a quarter million if they've got evidence for evolution. So far, nearly 4,000 have refused to debate. Last week, I spoke at University of Northern Michigan. Eighty professors refused to debate me. The week before that, I was in University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. One hundred professors were personally asked. A hundred of them refused. So I'm not going to get into an email debate. I speak over 900 times a year. There are millions of people who want to hear, so why waste time on those that don't want to hear? I just don't waste time on them. No, I don't want to cast my pearls before swine, like it says in Matthew chapter 7. If I had, uh, had to plant a garden to feed my family, and half my yard was good dirt, and the other half is hard rock, I'm going to plant the good dirt first. If I get time, then I'll go work on the rock. If I don't get time, oh well, I didn't get time. And there are so many millions who want to hear, I'm going to work on those first, and then those who don't want to hear, well, I'll get to them if, if I get time. That's why. I just don't waste much time with that. All right, I hope you've enjoyed our question answer session. I know it's been long, uh, but uh, we always get questions on things like this. My schedule's on my website, drdino.com. If I'm coming to your area, come on out, bring skeptics and scoffers. We always have Q&A time. Sometimes they get very lively. <laughs> That's fine. I don't have all the answers, but I know who does. It's my Heavenly Father. The God that created this world told us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, and told us to be ready always to give an answer, and that's what I want to do. I want to please Him and win souls to His kingdom. So if you have things that are keeping you from trusting Christ as your Savior, get them resolved. There is an answer out there. I may not have it, but I might know who does, and I can steer you that direction. If you're listening to this tape or coming to one of our seminars and you're not sure you're going to heaven, the most important thing you need to do is give your heart to Jesus Christ and be saved. You need to realize you're a sinner. You're going to hell. Christ died for you and He's willing to save you if you'll ask Him. So we'll have an invitation here to show you how you can trust Christ as your Savior. Or you can go to our website, drdino.com, and read right there how to go to heaven. Or go to Ray Comfort's website, livingwaters.com, and learn more about how to go to heaven. Hope this helps. Thank you so much. For more information on the ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503 or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.